Black family has one of the strongest bloodlines in the Harry Potter series and has a fascinating history. Some of the most fascinating characters from this family, in my opinion, are the Black sisters. This includes Bellatrix Lestrange, Narcissa Malfoy, and Andromeda Tonks. In this video, I'm going to explain the origins of all three of these sisters, starting from their childhood to their final fates at the end of the series. Cygnus Black III and Jarella Rosier, both from pureblood families that have strong connections to Voldemort and his army of Death Eaters, got married and had three daughters in the 1950s, Bellatrix the oldest, Andromeda the middle, and Narcissa the youngest. The three grew up with a very wealthy lifestyle, being from the pureblood Black family. They were all taught about the importance of blood purity from a young age, and grew up prejudiced in favor of purebloods. Being the oldest, Bellatrix was the first to go to Hogwarts and was sorted into Slytherin almost as soon as the sorting hat hit her head. Andromeda followed suit and was also sorted into Slytherin, and a few years later, Narcissa was too. While at school, Bellatrix quickly became friends with fellow purebloods who aimed to be Death Eaters and joined Voldemort after they finished school. One of these people was a boy named Rodolphus Lestrange. After they finished their seven years at Hogwarts, the two got married. But the marriage was nothing more than Bellatrix fulfilling her family's pureblood marriage tradition, and she showed no affection toward him whatsoever, never even mentioning him in conversations throughout the entire series, or bearing him a child. While Bellatrix married out of obligation, Narcissa and Andromeda actually married out of affection. Narcissa married a man named Lucius Malfoy, who she also met at Hogwarts. He was from another pureblood family just as wealthy as the Black family. Bellatrix and Narcissa went down a very different path than their sister. They both supported Voldemort. Bellatrix became a Death Eater, and while Narcissa never officially joined his ranks, her husband Lucius introduced her to the lifestyle of Death Eaters, and she supported her husband, sister, and Voldemort in the crimes that they committed. Andromeda, on the other hand, married a muggle-born named Ted Tonks, breaking her family's pureblood marriage tradition, and refused to have any part in Voldemort and his army of followers. Because of this, she was disowned by her sisters and the rest of her family. We, Narcissa and I, have never set eyes on our sister since she married the Mudblood. They marked her face out on the Black family tree just like they did Sirius Blacks. Andromeda sisters are still here because they made lovely, respectable, pureblood marriages. But Andromeda married a muggle-born, Ted Tonks. So, both Narcissa and Andromeda had kids with their husbands. Andromeda had a daughter that she named Nymphadora Tonks in 1973, and Narcissa had a son seven years later in 1980 named Draco Malfoy. The first cousins, Draco and Nymphadora, never met officially, although they did fight on opposite sides during the Battle of Hogwarts many years later, so it's possible that they saw brief glimpses of each other during the battle, but it's unlikely. As I said before, Bellatrix showed no interest whatsoever in her husband Rodolphus. She instead was fully loyal to Voldemort and showed great affection for him. This can be seen very clearly in the way that she acts. Bellatrix leaned towards Voldemort, for mere words could not demonstrate her longing for closeness. She was obsessed with trying to please him, and she might have been the closest thing to affection that Voldemort ever felt for someone other than his snake Nagini. Proof of this is in the way that he responds to one of her compliments. My lord, it is an honor to have you here in our family's house. There can be no higher pleasure. That means a great deal, Bellatrix, from you. Her face flooded with color. Her eyes welled with tears of delight. Voldemort eventually fell at the hands of Harry Potter in 1981, only a few years after Bellatrix and her husband Rodolphus, along with Narcissa's husband Lucius, had joined his crusade. A bunch of Death Eaters were rounded up, Lucius included, but Lucius claimed that he was innocent and was acting under the Imperius Curse that would allow Voldemort to have complete control over Lucius, making him do whatever he wanted him to do. Scores of witches and wizards have claimed that they only did you know who's bidding under the influence of the Imperious Curse. But here's the rub. How do we sort out the liars? He said that every crime he committed was under Voldemort's Imperious Curse, and he was freed, unlike most of his other fellow Death Eaters. Bellatrix and Rodolphus, along with Bellatrix's brother-in-law, Rebastian, and Barty Crouch Jr., all avoided capture for some time and continued to look for their master. The Lestrangers and Barty Crouch Jr. were branded with being the most loyal to the Dark Lord because they were the only ones that never stopped looking. While they were searching for Voldemort, they went after Frank Longbottom, an order for the Ministry of Magic and a member of the Order of the Phoenix, thinking that he had information on the whereabouts of their master. They tortured him for hours, and when he refused to talk, they tortured his wife, Alice Longbottom. The four tortured them so severely that the two were tortured into insanity 
and became essentially like vegetables. The four were brought before the court at the Ministry of Magic. Unlike other Death Eaters who denied their involvement with Voldemort, the Lestranges proudly claimed that they were loyal to him, especially Bellatrix. As she was sitting in front of the court, she was described as, she was sitting in the chained chair as though it were a throne. The four were all sentenced to life in Azkaban in a unanimous decision. As they were being taken out, Bellatrix yelled to the man that sentenced her, Barty Crouch. The Dark Lord will rise again, Crouch. Throw us into Azkaban, we will wait. He will rise again and will come for us. He will reward us beyond any of his other followers. We alone were faithful. We alone tried to find him. While their sister went to Azkaban, Andromeda and Narcissa continued to raise their family. Lucius being free allowed for him and Narcissa to live a good life and raise their son in a very wealthy household. He was dearly loved and spoiled by his mother, while his father was rather hard on him and preached to him about the importance of blood purity. Andromeda and her muggle-born husband, Ted Tonks, raised their daughter in a household that had far less money, but far better morals and ideals. Their daughter Nymphadora, who hated being called that, Don't call me. Nymphadora. Preferred being called by her last name, Tonks. Tonks went to Hogwarts in 1984 and was sorted into Hufflepuff, and was actually in the same year of Hogwarts as Charlie Weasley, Ron's older brother. Draco went to Hogwarts the year after his cousin finished her seven years, once again ensuring that they didn't meet. He was sorted into Slytherin and already had friends, Crab and Goyle, that he had known since he was a child because all of their fathers were Death Eaters. Draco continued to be spoiled by Narcissa and Lucius. Examples of this are his parents sending him large, expensive care packages and his father buying the whole Slytherin Quidditch team the newest and best brooms to ensure that Draco would be on the team as Seeker. Those are Nimbus 2001s. How did you get those? A gift from Draco's father. In 1994, Andromeda's daughter Nymphadora passed her test to become an Auror after many years of studying under the training of Alistair Moody. Andromeda was proud but often worried for her daughter's safety. During this time, Bellatrix, her husband Rodolphus, and her brother-in-law Bastion were all locked up in Azkaban, still awaiting their master's return. Voldemort eventually did return to power, and he called all of his Death Eaters back to him. He had this to say about the Lestranges. The Lestranges should stand here, but they are entombed in Azkaban. They were faithful. They went to Azkaban rather than renounce me. When Azkaban is broken open, the Lestranges will be honored beyond their dreams. Voldemort came through with his promise and did a mass breakout of Azkaban, freeing 10 Death Eaters that included Bellatrix, Rodolphus, and Rebastian. 14 years in Azkaban had changed Bellatrix's appearance a great deal. Azkaban had hollowed Bellatrix Lestrange's face, making it gaunt and skull-like, but it was alive with a feverish, fanatical glow. Bellatrix and the others were wanted by the Ministry and had to stay in hiding along with Voldemort, who nobody believed had actually returned thanks to the Minister for Magic Cornelius Fudge not believing Harry. Andromeda's daughter, Nymphadora, was one of the few Ministry employees who believed that Voldemort really had returned, and she joined the Order of the Phoenix to help fight against Voldemort and his Death Eaters, along with protect the prophecy that had to do with Harry and Voldemort, which Voldemort was desperate to get his hands on. Bellatrix was reunited with her sister and her sister's husband Lucius after she escaped Azkaban, and one night Voldemort sent Bellatrix and Lucius, along with a few others, on a mission to the Department of Mysteries in the Ministry of Magic to retrieve the prophecy about Harry and Voldemort. Narcissa gave Voldemort the information that he needed to get Harry there, when she used her Black Family heritage to speak to the Black Family house elf, Creature, who had been living with the Order of the Phoenix for almost a year because Sirius had offered his childhood Black Family home as headquarters for the Order. Voldemort used the information that Narcissa gave him to get Harry to the Department of Mysteries, where Lucius led the mission, and their mission was to take the prophecy once Harry picked it up, they themselves not being able to pick it up, because a prophecy can only be picked up by a person about who it is made. Why did Voldemort need me to come and get this? Prophecies can only be retrieved by those about whom they are made. When they met Harry and Harry's friends, including Ron, Hermione, Neville, Ginny, and Luna, Bellatrix taunted Harry. Pity? Pity? Baby. What? Along with taunting Neville, making fun of his parents, whom she had tortured into insanity. Neville Longbottom, is it? How's mom and dad? She later tortured Neville with the same spell that she had used on his parents. Let's see how long Longbottom lasts before he cracks like his parents. Things escalated when Harry and his friends tried to fight back and escape. The Order of the Phoenix showed up, and Bellatrix met her niece Nymphadora Tonks for the first time, and they started to duel. 
Bellatrix ended up beating and badly injuring Tonks when she knocked her unconscious. Before that though, Tonks was able to stun her aunt's husband, Lucius, which led to his capture. After Bellatrix beat Tonks, she started dueling with her cousin Sirius Black. Sirius started taunting Bellatrix about the Black family and their pure blood beliefs until Bellatrix got the upper hand and went on the run and was the only Death Eater to escape being captured by Dumbledore who had arrived to help the Order. As she was running away, Harry went after her, desperate to get revenge on Bellatrix for killing his godfather. <laughs> Harry tried to use the torture curse on her, which caused her a few seconds of pain, but then she began to taunt him. Never used an unforgivable curse before, have you, boy? You need to mean them, Potter. You need to really want to cause pain, to enjoy it. I'll give you a lesson. Harry dodged the spell and felt the scar burn, indicating that Voldemort was mad and that he knew that the prophecy was destroyed during the fight. It's gone, and he knows. Your dear old mate Voldemort knows it's gone. He's not going to be happy with you, is he? What? What do you mean? For the first time, there was fear in her voice. Voldemort arrived there, and Bellatrix begged for his forgiveness. Master, I tried. I tried. Do not punish me. Be quiet, Bella. I shall deal with you in a moment. Voldemort dueled Dumbledore, and then grabbed Bellatrix and disoperated to escape. After this incident, Lucius was caught, and the famous Malfoy name that had managed to stay clean for so long was now tarnished, and Lucius was locked up in Azkaban with a life sentence, along with all the other Death Eaters that got caught that night. This affected Narcissa and Draco the most, being put in the spotlight. Dumbledore said that Lucius was probably happy to be in Azkaban because of how angry Voldemort was at him for failing the mission as the leader, forcing Voldemort to reveal himself for the first time. He's back! and getting himself and a bunch of other Death Eaters locked in Azkaban. Since Voldemort couldn't punish Lucius, he came up with another way to punish his whole family by giving Draco the impossible task of killing Dumbledore. Draco officially became a Death Eater the summer after the battle in the Department of Mysteries, and he was to complete the task during his sixth year at Hogwarts. In preparation for this, Bellatrix trained her nephew to prepare him. She taught him how to block jinxes, taught him the art of occlumency, meaning blocking someone from reading your mind, and a few other things to ensure that he was well prepared for his mission. Narcissa was worried for her son, who she loved more than anything in the world, and she went as far as to go to Severus Snape for help, accompanied by her sister Bellatrix. Narcissa was hysterical, crying in her hands, and she thought that Voldemort was sending Draco on a suicide mission. There is nothing I wouldn't do anymore. She begged Snape to help Draco on his mission, and he agreed. Bellatrix, however, didn't trust Snape and thought he wasn't loyal to the Dark Lord. Bellatrix started to question Snape, and Snape answered all of her questions, but she still wasn't satisfied. To ensure his loyalty to the Dark Lord and to satisfy Bellatrix, she asked him to make the unbreakable vow with Narcissa about helping Draco with his mission. Will you, Severus Snape, watch over Draco? As he attempts to fulfill the Dark Lord's wishes. I will. If you break an unbreakable vow, you die. And by doing this, Snape would prove his loyalty to the Dark Lord to satisfy Bellatrix. During the school year, Draco repaired a vanishing cabinet to ensure that Bellatrix and a few other Death Eaters, along with a werewolf named Greyback, could come into the Hogwarts grounds. Draco went to kill Dumbledore, but he couldn't do it. And Snape fulfilled the unbreakable vow and killed Dumbledore. How about a cadaver? <laughs> Bellatrix, Snape, and the others led Draco away from the school. As they were leaving Hogwarts, Bellatrix caught Hagrid's hut on fire and went after Harry. No. He belongs to the Dark Lord. They ended up escaping the Hogwarts grounds and disapparated. That summer, Voldemort freed all the Death Eaters in Azkaban, including Lucius. Voldemort, still angry with Lucius for failing to retrieve the prophecy, commanded Lucius and Narcissa to allow their manor to be the base of operations for Voldemort and his army. Bellatrix was honored to have Voldemort in their house, but Lucius and Narcissa were not too pleased. Voldemort openly mocked their family at a Death Eater meeting by mentioning their sister Andromeda marrying a mudblood, their niece marrying a werewolf, Remus Lupin, and their disgraceful relation to blood traitors, mudbloods, and werewolves, along with taking Lucius's wand. Lord, my lord, I require your wand. One of the most disrespectful things you can do in the wizarding world. At this Death Eater meeting, they were discussing Harry being moved from his home at Privet Drive to another location and how they were going to capture him. Harry had six decoys, so there were seven Harrys, and Voldemort and his Death Eaters didn't know which one was which. Each Harry was going to a different location, and the location that the real Harry was going to was Andromeda and Ted Tonk's house. 
Their daughter, Nymphadora, was one of the ones escorting a decoy and was going to a different location. When Harry arrived at the Tonks' house, along with Hagrid, who had escorted him, Andromeda was worried for the safety of her daughter. What happened to our daughter? Hagrid said you were ambushed. Where is Nymphadora? I don't know. We don't know what happened to anyone else. She and Ted exchanged looks. Dora will be okay, Andromeda. She knows her stuff. She's been in plenty of tight spots with the Aurors. During the ambush, Bellatrix and her husband Rodolphus went after her niece Tonks and tried very hard to kill her, but was unsuccessful when Ron, who was flying with Tonks disguised as one of the decoy Harrys, ended up hurting Rodolphus in the fight, shooting a spell directly at his face, allowing for their escape. While Hagrid and Harry were still at the Tonks house, Andromeda attended to Hagrid's wounds and sent them to the burrow with a port key and asked them to send word as soon as they find out about their daughter. When Nymphadora arrived at the burrow, they let Ted and Andromeda know that she was okay. When the Ministry fell and Voldemort took control, Andromeda and Ted were interrogated and tortured by Death Eaters trying to get information about Harry and the Order out of them, but they refused to talk. Lupin, their son-in-law, later said that they were shaken, but they were okay. Around that same time, Andromeda and Ted found out that they were going to be grandparents and that their daughter was pregnant with a baby boy. Their son-in-law, Lupin, ended up leaving their daughter after this, wanting to help Harry on his mission, and also because he was terrified that his son would be a werewolf like him. Tonks wanted to stay at her parents' house during this time, until Lupin finally came to his senses and returned to his wife and unborn son. Teddy Lupin was born a few months after that, and Andromeda became a proud grandmother. When Voldemort took over the Ministry, they began persecuting Muggleborns through the Muggleborn Registration Commission, which charged Muggleborns with having stolen their magic and their wands from real witches and wizards, and Ted being Muggleborn was forced to go on the run. This left Andromeda all alone. She was of course safe because she was pureblood, being from the noble Black family. Voldemort ordered Bellatrix to put a fake sword of Gryffindor, which they thought was the real one, in her family vault to keep it safe. Harry, Ron, and Hermione had the real sword and were captured by Snatchers later that year and were brought to Malfoy Manor where Bellatrix and the Malfoy family were. Bellatrix saw one of the Snatchers with the sword and freaked out because she thought that they went into her vault. Where'd you get that from? It was in her bag when we searched her. Reckon it's mine now. <laughs> Bellatrix ordered Draco to either kill or drag the Snatcher's bodies away, and Narcissa argued with her sister. Don't you dare speak to Draco like, Be quiet! The situation is graver than you can possibly imagine, says he. Bellatrix then started to torture Hermione and question her about the sword. <laughs> I didn't take anything! Harry and Ron fought back and ended up getting the upper hand until Bellatrix put a knife to Hermione's throat and demanded that they drop their wands. Drop your wands. And they obeyed. She then called Voldemort with the dark mark. Call him. Dobby the house elf, the former house elf of the Malfoys, came to save Harry and his friends. How dare you defy your masters! Dobby has no master. When Dobby disoperated with Harry and all the others, Bellatrix threw a knife at them, and it ended up stabbing Dobby, leading to his death. Dobby is happy to be with his friend. Voldemort was furious that Bellatrix, Narcissa, and Lucius had allowed Harry to escape, and punished them severely. When Voldemort learned that Harry was at Hogwarts, he and all of his Death Eaters went there, and the Battle of Hogwarts took place. To ensure his son's safety, Narcissa gave Draco her wand, because his had been stolen by Harry at Malfoy Manor before their escape. This made both Narcissa and Lucius wandless in the battle, as Voldemort had taken Lucius' wand months before, as I mentioned earlier. During the battle, Bellatrix dueled her niece Nymphadora Tonks, and although Tonks put up a good fight, Bellatrix got the upper hand and silenced her niece once and for all. Tonks' husband Lupin was also killed in the battle, orphaning their baby boy, Teddy. Voldemort ordered a ceasefire and told Harry to come meet him in the Forbidden Forest to give himself up, and he used the killing curse on Harry. Voldemort was knocked down after he cast a spell, and Bellatrix attempted to help her master up, but he pushed her away. He then ordered someone to check to see if Harry was dead, and Narcissa stepped forward because she saw it as an opportunity to see if her son was okay. She realized that Harry was still alive, and she whispered to him, Is he alive? Draco, is he alive? Harry nodded his head yes, and Narcissa, now grateful to Harry, betrayed Voldemort and said that Harry was dead. Harry understood. Narcissa knew that the only way she would be permitted to enter Hogwarts and find her son was as part of the conquering army. She no longer cared whether Voldemort won. Voldemort took Harry's supposed dead body back to the castle and told everyone it was over. 
Neville Longbottom then stepped forward and killed Voldemort's snake, which started the fight again. Harry, who was still pretending to be dead on the ground, saw Lucius and Narcissa running through the crowd, not even attempting to fight, screaming and looking for their son. Bellatrix continued to fight and was the last Death Eater standing, making it just her and Voldemort. She cast a killing curse at Ginny Weasley that nearly got her, which enraged Ginny's mother, Molly Weasley. Not my daughter, you bitch! Bellatrix taunted Mrs. Weasley while they fought, bringing up her son who had died during the battle. And while Bellatrix laughed at Molly, she was hit by a killing curse square in the chest directly over her heart. Bellatrix's gloating smile froze. Her eyes seemed to bulge. For the tiniest space of time, she knew what had happened, and then she toppled. Voldemort screamed with rage when he saw this happen, once again showing that she was the closest thing to affection that he ever felt. After the battle, Narcissa and her family were reunited in the Great Hall, where they seemed uncomfortable being there, but did not leave. Because Narcissa had betrayed Voldemort and the entire family had stopped fighting, they were all forgiven for their crimes and were all set free. Andromeda and Ted were devastated to hear about their daughter and son-in-law's deaths. They would get custody of their grandson, Teddy Lupin, and would raise him the way that they thought their daughter would have. Narcissa Malfoy eventually became a grandmother to Scorpius Malfoy, who she loved very much, when Draco married Astoria Greengrass. The Black Sisters were raised in a dark family. Bellatrix embraced the darkness and took it to new levels. Andromeda chose a different lifestyle than her family expected, showing that she had a true heart through and through, and Narcissa chose a dark path, but proved that she had light in her heart just like her sister Andromeda. Each sister had a fascinating tale and all got the endings that they deserved.